Uh, next, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Charles Van Vick. Van Vick. Um, and I would never have guessed that, but like, again, I'm not, not really Dutch, I guess. Um, he's, he was from South Africa, and again, uh, we had a little article on this back 10, 12 years ago. Um, and he's, he's actually uh, written uh, a book and has um, a, uh, um, a DVD on, on his story. Uh, it's called Shooting Back the Right and Duty of Self-Defense. And indeed, there is a duty to self-defense. Um, it was, it was um, uh, interesting uh, when Gerard said that um, they, they uh, defend their family. And indeed, a lot of parents don't think about the kids, uh, especially women. They're the mother, they think, OK, well, whatever the, the criminal would want, he would want from me. And when you go to somebody like that and say, no, what if he wants your little girl? What are you going to do to stop him? Boy, their lives light up. They just hadn't thought about that. And that strikes a primal chord. They do have a duty to defend. And, and the children are very much dependent upon their parents and their, their duty to protect them. So um, this, by the way, this stuff is, I guess, this is published on World Net Daily, that publishes the books that Cheryl wrote. And um, he should have some interesting perspectives on what he went through. And uh, because uh, fortunately for us, I don't know that any of us have been through what he has. So uh, with no further ado, um, I'd like to introduce you. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to watch the time this evening. Where I come from, the Koza people, the black locals, say that uh, God gave time to Africans, but he only gave watches to Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll watch the time. On the 25th of July, 1993, while we were sitting in a church service in Cape Town, South Africa, there was all of a sudden a noise at the front door of the church. Some young people were standing on a stage singing to us in the uh, congregation, and as this noise happened, a terrorist stepped into the church service with automatic assault rifles and hand grenades. And we're going to discuss a little bit about that this evening. I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea of what was going on in South Africa at the time. Uh, tell you about the attack, a little bit about the post-shooting trauma that I went through, our Firearms Control Act that we have in South Africa now, disarming the population. And uh, also going to give you a bit of an idea of how terrorists think. What, what goes through their mind and how do they see things? So I hope you'll benefit from the evening getting a good idea of uh, what your enemies are thinking, both maybe locally, those who want to disarm you, and those outside of America who want to see the demise uh, of the United States of America. So we'll get straight into that. So my family has been in Africa since the late 1600s. They arrived there, so over 300 years in, in Africa. Um, I'm a missionary with an organization called Frontline Fellowship. Historically, we've worked in the war zones of Africa where the conventional missionary can't live with his family. So my colleagues have flown in at treetop level um, into the Sudan. Uh, they've been shot up behind helicopters in the Nuba Mountains in Sudan. Uh, been bombed in churches on Sunday morning. I've been detained in the Democratic Republic of the Congo which is not democratic or republic, but either way, uh, if you hear those words in Africa, you've got to get worried. Um, so we've had uh, some exciting things happening. I've had three attacks that I've been through. The one I did the best thing I could possibly do, and that was drive away as fast as possible, flight. And the other two I had to stay and fight. So we'll talk a little bit about those this evening. And um, the book, as uh, Philip showed you, Published by World Net Daily. It's really great to be an African and have a book published in America. It's uh, really great. And then they made a documentary about it too. Uh, they'll be available at the restaurant afterwards. We're not allowed to sell books in this building apparently. So um, at the restaurant, if you'd like to buy them, please buy my book and my DVD. Um, I have a family with four children. We've uh, in America just for one year. Really excited to be here. It's been absolutely amazing. My children think, or the boys at least think, they are in Lego heaven. <laughs> I've never seen anything like this in their lives before. And uh, well, one of my real claims to fame is that my one boy, Jason, when he was much younger, he used to love Superman. And so he had a Superman suit that when he went to sleep at night, my wife and I had to wash and dry and have ready for him when he got up the next morning. 
And being a missionary, it's really great when you only have one set of clothes for at least one of your kids, you know, they just wear it permanently. So he, he firmly believed he was Superman. And uh, my wife was out one day in the garden, she was pregnant, she had a big pole in her hand, and she was trying to get the chickens back into the chicken coop in Cape Town. Um, and so there she was in the garden with us, and Jason in his Superman suit was following my wife all around the garden, following her. And eventually, my wife got the last chicken into the chicken coop, and she closed the gate. And being a good missionary's wife, she shot up prayer up into heaven and said, Thank you, Lord. She heard this voice behind her saying, I'm not the Lord, I'm Superman. <laughs> so, so I'm the father of Superman, just to give you a bit of an idea. We in South Africa had an organization called the African National Congress that's come to power. They're basically um, in cahoots with the South African Communist Party. And just to give you a bit of an idea of how they came to power in South Africa, basically there was a blockade of hostile communist nations just north of South Africa. In Africa, each uh, country is um, self-reliant, has total independence. It's not like America where you have a, a group or a federal type system. So each country is totally independent. We also had uh, economic warfare against our country at the time. And that took uh, place to destabilize our country and through um, sanctions and that because of the uh, apartheid issue, uh, it was destabilizing the country. We had the uh, American and also the Soviet Union, Soviet Union putting sanctions on our country and put millions of people out of work, which is very helpful for the communists because they could use them as cannon fodder and the unemployed could be dragged into the revolution very easily. We also had psychological warfare going on in our country uh, at that time. And basically that was to break down the will of the people in the country. So through things like the necklace method, which you might have heard, which Nelson Mandela's group, the African National Congress, were doing, they would take a person, anything from a 12-year-old girl upwards, uh, put a tire of a car around them, throw gas all over them, and light them as a human torch. And the, um, the rubber would go right into the skin and tear off the skin of the people. And this was called a necklace method. The black people believe that if you die in a fire like that, you actually lose your soul. And for African people who worship their ancestors, that's a big challenge. It means you don't exist any longer. And what they would do after that was to get people to take part in the revolution and all the demonstrations against the state, they would just have a little box of matches, go into the areas, the slums areas, and shake the box of matches, and everybody knew you just do what you're told, otherwise this will happen to somebody in your family. So that was part of the psychological warfare that was going on. We also had the idea is if you don't uh, back the new revolution in South Africa, your sports teams won't be recognized around the world. So we had that kind of pressure on us. Um, and the idea that was put out around the world was all the blacks are supporting this revolutionary cause of Nelson Mandela and the African National Congress. But nobody in the West knew that there were other black moderate organizations and conservative organizations that were far bigger than his group. Just the rest of the world didn't know about them. So they got no finances or back backup from the, from the rest of the world. And so we had internal revolution going on, uh, destabilizing the country, becoming uh, ungovernable, basically forcing the, uh, the National Party government at that time to negotiate and surrender through to the Communists and the African National Congress. So that is basically what was going on in the country. And that's where we had the incident of the St. James Massacre uh, came into the picture. So while we were sitting in the church service, the terrorists stepped into the church. They'd taken nails and put it on the outside of the hand grenades. And they took those grenades and they lobbed them into the congregation and they opened up fire with their automatic assault rifles. And I was sitting in the church watching this. Uh, when I saw it first happening, I thought it was a play that they were doing. And it's only when I saw the wood of the benches just jumping up in the air from the uh, automatic assault rifles that I realized this is no play, this is the real thing. I then went down onto the ground with everybody else. We got to try and get down as those who possibly can, uh, behind all the benches, under the benches, and there was one young man, uh, Gerard Harker, 21 years old, had a hand grenade land right next to his pew. 
Well, he fell on top of that hand grenade and took a full body blow to himself to protect the people sitting around him. Can you imagine that in split seconds having to make uh, a decision like that? Another young chap, 17-year-old uh, Richard O'Keel, had two little girls sitting next to him. He pulled them down onto the ground, he fell on top of them and took a bullet straight to the head, uh, protecting those little girls. And we as missionaries obviously use that as an example of Jesus Christ dying for us, giving his life for us. Um, as we're teaching people, and when I go into places like the Congo, um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, we reach out to people there because of the wars and the raping and the chaos that's going on in their society and, and say, this, we've been through this ourselves, so we, we can uh, stand with you on these issues. Well, I had a, a little point three eight special revolver with me, um, little Rossi, would be classified a, a Saturday night special, I think, <laughs> in America, a really cheap little revolver. And I pulled that out while I was crouching down on the ground while everybody was as low as possible uh, in the service. And I uh, knelt behind the bench. The church is built like a, um, a cinema. So it's high at the back and low in the front. And I could kneel behind the bench and I took two shots at the attackers who were standing at the front door of the church. And everybody was nice and low so I could shoot over, um, over the benches at the attackers shooting down at them. The, um, I realized at that time that I was too far away from them. It's a big church, can seat one and a half thousand people. I was fourth row from the back. So it was a long shot over a lot of people. And a little snub nose revolver, two inch. Um, those of you who know guns, because I don't know too much about guns myself, but the little I do know, they're not very accurate. So taking a long shot like that, um, the chances of hitting somebody is almost impossible, especially with the adrenaline pumping and the chaos around us. So I went onto all fours and I crawled to the edge of the, the pew and I ran out the back door of the church hoping to come in behind the terrorists and shoot them at close range in the back to, to stop the, the chaos. Um, and so I kicked open the back door of the church, ran outside, and as soon as I came running around the corner, all of the terrorists, were, all four of them, were at the get <coughs> car. And I came running out into their full view. I jumped back behind the wall. And one of the terrorists was standing at the back left door of the car with his automatic assault rifle on his hip. And he was looking at the door they had come out of. And what I didn't know at that stage was I'd actually hit one of them inside the church. And so they'd run away. Um, so I stepped out again after seeing them there. I took my last three shots of my little five-shot revolver at them, and they jumped in the vehicle and drove off. I then ran to a neighbor and called for help, asked them to get the police to come along and to uh, come and help us out there. So that uh, gives you a bit of an idea of the, the chaos. You can imagine the adrenaline's pumping. Um, there's pandemonium in the church. Uh, people are dying. There's gurgling going on. Their corpses lying around. Uh, and at the end of the day, 11 people were murdered and over 50 were injured. Uh, one of my friend's uh, wives also had a nail from one of the grenades that they put on the outside of the grenade uh, stuck in her foot. So very traumatic experience to go through. We have to help get those people on to, in, onto ambulance benches and get them out. One person was carried out uh, on a bench. Uh, one young seaman from Russia that the church had a ministry to had a hand grenade land right in his lap on the, as he was sitting in the bench and it blew off both his legs and one arm. So, to give you a bit of an idea of um, the carnage, I saw the, the police photographs afterwards when I had to deal with the lawyers that were dealing with the case, and uh, it was terrible. I mean, you could see people's head almost, um, you know, whole scalp up open and blown to pieces and things. So, it was really traumatic. Um, I went through what some psychologists scoff at uh, and say it doesn't exist, called post shooting trauma. And you might have heard about this young, pretty little girl in Florida that just shot a guy with a pink revolver when he came three o'clock in the morning, grabbed her around her neck and started dragging her upstairs in her house. Um, and she managed to get away. Her fiance came and protected her. But I saw an interview with her and she was saying, when it starts getting dark, I, I start getting worried. I get nervous. I wonder if there's going to be retribution, if somebody else is going to attack us. Um, you know, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm, scared about all these things. But that's basically what you go through after the trauma. So I had headaches for no reason. I was sweating for no reason. 
Um, in a room like this, we were sitting with the police psychologist working through the issues of the, the uh, what was called the St. James um, Massacre, and a door blew closed. Bang! Well, you want to see a bunch of people that are traumatized. We almost all dived under our chairs, you know, just because of a door that blew closed with the wind. So, very chaotic. You're scared all the time. You're worried about people following you. You don't know what's, what's going on in your life. Um, you don't know if you've done the right thing. And so, very, very difficult situation to be in. So, that's part of the trauma that you go through. And I saw this young girl saying, she's worried. She you know, doesn't know what's going on. And there's uh, all this chaos and concern. I thought, gee, she's just going through the post-shooting trauma um, that I've been through twice already. So, if you come across people who have been through attacks like this, you need to be able to support them and help them and say, look, you know, I have an idea of what you've been through. I've heard about this before. You've done the right thing. You know, don't think that you have it. We back you totally. So it was great. In South Africa, there's people be phoning, radio phoning shows and saying, we were at the church. We think Charles did the right thing. Thank goodness he had a firearm. We were expecting these guys to come in and mow down everybody and kill 1,000 of us. And that didn't happen. Um, and so it was really helpful for people to back you up in that way. It makes a big difference. Well, we um, in South Africa, after all this chaos, the African National Congress coming to power, that's Nelson Mandela's group, they started instituting uh, gun control. So they brought about the new laws called the Firearms Control Act, which is causing uh, havoc in our country right now. And as more and more guns can't get off the streets from the law abiding, it obviously makes no difference to the illegal guns. They're not, people aren't handing in their illegal guns to the government. And so these guns are being smelted away. Apparently the European community is paying uh, per gun that gets melted away uh, money to the South African government. But big surprise for most of you, um, the government official that was in control that was instituting the Firearms Control Act was also the chairman of the Communist Party. Now we all know the <coughs> Communists have murdered over 100 million people since 1917, mostly in their own countries. And what do they do before they do this in any country? Gun control. Got to disarm the population. Right? If you've got an armed population and an armed <coughs> government, you can only have a war. Right? But you have genocides when you have an armed government and the population are unarmed, they cannot protect themselves at all. You cannot have a genocide happening in an armed society. It doesn't happen, cannot happen, never has and never will. You can only have it in a disarmed society. So, they brought in all these strange laws into South Africa. You've got to be 21 years old to be able to have a gun. Uh, you have to renew it every five years. You need to prove your need. We have the highest murder rate in the world, but you have to prove your need to have one. Literally, the guys that decide on whether you can have a gun or not, but writing letters back to people, like for instance a woman would say, I need a gun and what have you, they'd write back from the central firearms register and say, you don't need a gun because you've already allowed your husband to have one. Huh? As if the husband sits home all day next to his wife protecting her. You know, I mean, really stupid ideas. And so. It's been a real struggle there. We're busy with court cases right now, suing the government uh, on these various issues. You need to be a South African citizen or a permanent resident to get a gun. So if you visit to our country, you're just going to be there for a year or so, you're going to be one of the sitting ducks. Um, one of the changes to the law, you're guilty until proven innocent. Now that goes against all Western legal thinking. I'm sure our lawyer lady would be able to tell us uh, about that. But if I am charged for anything with regards to this law in South Africa, I need to go prove my innocence in court. Now, in America, you know that when you go to court, you're going to be innocent until proven guilty. How on earth do you prove your innocence? And so we have these really stupid ideas coming into the country. And when we come over here with my family and I, we've just been blown away at how amazing your systems are in place here. I mean, I know you people are concerned about what's going on, because it's not the way it used to be, and things seem to be getting out of hand, but from where we come from, we thought we were in heaven on earth here. <laughs> uh, just absolutely amazing. Well, we are also allowed searches without a warrant for not just the police, anybody appointed by the minister. So it gets really bad. Um, that starts happening, Could have been <coughs> innocence in court, you know, you've got no more rights. I spoke to a man on the phone, 
who woke up one night, what they do is they take uh, CDs or DVDs, they burn them at your windows, uh, because we don't live with centralized heating or air in our homes, we sleep with our windows open almost all year, um, and they burn these by your window, and this poisons you while you're sleeping, and then they'll break through your security gates and through your door to get into your house, and you won't hear a thing. And I've been to a, a policeman's house who was off duty, they smashed his his, uh, his security gate and his door to get in, um, broke in, cleaned out his house, and him and his wife and his little four-month-old baby slept through everything. So this is the, the way things are going. Um, this man, his wife woke up at night and said, I've got a, a massive headache, there's something wrong, and obviously this poison didn't knock her out. Um, she had uh, woken up from it, she said to her husband, go find out there's something wrong in the house. He goes into the lounge and finds seven men inside his lounge. He shoots two of them dead. The other five he hands over to the police. They testified against him in court and he got two years in jail for shooting the other two in his lounge, in his home, because he didn't shoot a warning shot in his home. <laughs> now the law doesn't say you have to shoot a warning shot, but we have judges who think they can make up laws outside of the realms of parliament. And so this is the sort of thing that's going on in our country. There is chaos. One friend of mine, uh, wife worked at our, um, at our Cape High Court, and she said our justice system is being held together by bubblegum, to give you an idea of how things are going. Well, you only allow 200 rounds of ammunition now for the guns that you have, and you only allow one gun for self-defense. Well, what does a farmer do when he's attacked by four or five people with AK-47s on his farm? Uh, maybe a shotgun would be a little bit better than a .38 special revolver. Uh, well, when he's going into town, he can't lug around you know, his shotgun. He needs maybe a .38 special then. Um, so, very, very difficult circumstances, and they're basically <coughs> trying to make us into sitting ducks. Um, we have to write a test. We have to do an exam to be able to get a gun in South Africa now. Well, many people in our population can't even read. So, you know, how, how, how are they going to get themselves weapons? Well, we have an organization called the Black Gun Owners Association. Not as in black powder, as in black people, black skin color. And they are absolutely amazing. They're involved with civil disobedience. They're just saying, we will not renew our licenses. Our licenses that were given for life are now needing to be renewed every five years. We're not going to renew our licenses. Come and get them. Um, they put eight, 9,000 people on the street at a time saying, we refuse. We're not doing reapplications. We got our licenses, we're keeping our guns, and we're not going to reapply for anything. So, very strong uh, stand they've taken. Well, the, um, we only need, only allowed one gun for self-defense now. The reason I'm telling you all this is because every time, I come and visit America all the time to market my book, and every time I come here, I hear stories at the different states I'm going to about how um, your gun rights are being eroded. And your Second Amendment rights are extremely powerful. If you want to become slaves like the Africans, like all of us in Africa, then that needs to be done away with. And the liberal um, <coughs> agenda out there will work as much as they possibly can to take that away from you. Well, the, um, the other thing that we needed to, um, that we need to show in South Africa to be able to get a gun, can you believe this? You must be of stable mental condition. So when we were discussing this with the police, I told them that would count out the whole of all our members of parliament. They wouldn't be able to get a gun then. We don't have a castle doctrine. You shoot somebody inside your own house, you can be held liable, you can be charged for that. Like this man I told you about. Another farmer um, shot somebody inside his house, the police took his gun away because they needed it for ballistic testing. So it's in the newspapers, everybody knows. The bad guys have got away, they've got buddies, they all know this farmer's at home without a gun now. Well, uh, these are the, the struggles we're having. The um, people are standing up against this. We've got court cases. We've had marches to parliament. We've had demonstrations. And so we are doing whatever we possibly can legally to fight this agenda uh, in South Africa. Well, the government is loving the whole new idea of gun-free zones. You, as well as I know, the gun-free zones are the, some of the most dangerous places on earth. In fact, we were having a television interview because I had met with the terrorists after the revolution in South Africa. I've been uh, meeting with them, the commander, Letlapa Bekelele, and I've done television shows together, gone out for breakfast together. We disagree on absolutely everything except for the fact that 
Um, members of parliament in South Africa are paid too much. So politicians <laughs> are paid too much, that's one thing that we agree on. But one day while we were doing a television shoot at parliament, he introduced me to somebody. Now this is the commander of APLA, the people that, the terrorist organization that shot up our church. He introduces me to this man and he says to him, this is Charles van Weg. He is a survivor of the St. James Massacre. And he turns to his friend and he says, <coughs> then we thought the church was a gun-free zone, but boy did Charles have a surprise for us. In other words, the only reason they attacked the church was because they thought nobody would be armed inside the church. They were looking for sitting ducks. They didn't want anybody to shoot back at them. And so that's the way the mind thinks. They're not going to attack a church where they believe they're going to have a bunch of people that are armed. They're not going to attack people sitting in a meeting like this this evening. I mean, I feel so safe here. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> and so these people now in South Africa who I've um, spoken to and reached out to and spent time with, these former terrorists, they are now preparing for the second revolution in South Africa. And the reason for that is they're saying that the revolution that took place, the people that came to power aren't communist enough. So they want a pure communist revolution. And it's so interesting speaking to these people because they use the same words you use in America, but they have different <coughs> meanings. So I will sit and talk to them and they will say to me, do you know, we and our friends shed our blood to put these people into power. But they don't share their freedom with us. Freedom is access to resources. Freedom is government jobs. Freedom is money. Freedom is not American liberty. And I think that's part of the, the breakdown in communication uh, of people in the West not understanding the rhetoric back in Africa. And when they hear about people fighting for freedom, oh boy, we, we, we better back these guys. No, these are terrorists and they asked another thug in, in power and they're going, to, they're going to make you worse off than with the previous thug. That's the way it goes. They're not fighting for American liberty. They're not fighting for small government. They're fighting to get their hands onto the gold mines and the diamonds and everything else they possibly can. That is freedom. Democracy. Democracy means you get one vote once and never again. That's democracy. And whoever comes to power hangs onto power for the next 40 years. It's not... American democratic thinking. Um, if you uh, go a little bit deeper, you'll find that the, there might be other words that they're using, that, uh, that they, they just have a totally different worldview, a totally different ideology, and totally different meaning to those words. And obviously, when the Western press is there, well, they're impressed with this. These guys are fighting for freedom, just like our forefathers. And wow, they've uh, into democracy, and we have a functioning democracy, and isn't it amazing? I come here to America and I find out that South Africa is a democracy. South Africa is not a democracy. It never has been and hopefully, well, hopefully never will be. prefer a decent uh, republic, federal republic. But um, when you vote in South Africa, you don't vote for a person to represent you in parliament. You vote for a political party. And then it's proportional representation. So if you get 40% of the national vote, then your party gets 40% of the seats in parliament. The party head appoints who will be sitting in, in those seats. So the member of parliament only has to make sure his party president is happy with them. You can't phone anybody and complain to a member of parliament about anything because he doesn't care two hoots about what you think. He must just keep the party president happy and if he, if he gets upset with you, the party president, well, he'll replace you, kick you out of your seat and put somebody else in it. So that's the way it works. That's not democracy in your understanding of it, but that's what People are told, yeah, South Africa is now a democracy. No, it's not. It hasn't been, uh, never was, and isn't at the moment. So those are some of the, the struggles. There's a, a lot of uh, murders going on in our country right now. Exceptionally dangerous um, place to live in. Uh, just two years ago, I went into a slums area uh, with a friend. I had to drop him off there. In fact, he was a former terrorist who's become a Christian. So he's now, he's pro-gun and he's pro-freedom and all this sort of thing. And I dropped him off in the slums area, and all of a sudden I heard this voice behind me saying, turn around, hand over your gun, give us your cell phones, give us your money. And there was somebody with a, a gun. Another chap came up and started body searching me. 
started fiddling all over me and touching me and trying to find my gun. Uh, they took the cell phone, they took uh, the cash from me. I had passports from people from all over the world. I had to get photostats of them uh, because of some ministry we were going to do uh, in South Africa. All those passports disappeared with these guys. Um, and they couldn't find a gun on me. Well, my firearm was in an ankle holster and they didn't go down low enough to find it. So they were body searching me here with the chap in front with the gun, and the other chap behind me, body searching me, body searching me, couldn't find the gun at all. So they left me and went to my passenger in the vehicle. <coughs> they started bothering him, saying, give us your gun, give us your money, give us your cell phone. Well, he didn't have a cell phone, he didn't have a gun, and they started getting really agitated, but that gave me time to uh, pull out a 9mm Heckland cock, which I was carrying at the time, um, and prepare it for action. And I went to the front of the car. We drive on the, um, we drive on the right hand side. So I went to the front of the car and opened up fire at these uh, two thugs. Well, boy, was I in for surprise. There was somebody hiding somewhere that I never ever saw who was shooting back at me while these guys were running away while my lead was following them. So these, these people are jacked up. They're organized. They're not your dumb, stupid little criminal that hasn't got a clue of what's going on. So really interesting. Uh, really thankful that we uh, managed to get out of that again, um, alive and being able to tell the story. Um, I'd also just like to give you a little bit of an idea of the thinking of these guys. First of all, they've got no moral compulsion to do what is right. Okay? They decide on what is right and what is wrong, and so they define their own morality. And so there are times when people need to be murdered, there are times when lying can be done, and when theft uh, can take place, all for the cause. And so you find that uh, these guys will rob banks. Well, they're doing it for the cause. And so that's fine. There's no problem with it. Well, one of the chaps robbed a, a bank vehicle and stole money for himself. All the other terrorists rejected him totally for that. Because he is stealing for himself, personally. And so they, re they redefine morality into the whatever they want it to be. I know that doesn't happen in America amongst the liberals. I know they don't lie and don't steal or anything like that. So you don't have to worry about that. But uh, just in case this happens in the future, that people want to take your guns away, they'll lie about you, they'll lie about their statistics, they'll do it with a straight face, and they'll do whatever it takes for the agenda to be done. And you being a conservative, nice, honest, law-abiding citizen, you don't like to tell lies. And so you, you get all flustered. We don't, we don't know how to deal with these issues. So these are areas that we need to really work at. The other thing is they believe in perpetual war. They believe they're at war all the time. What do we as conservatives think? Well, we go into battle every now and again, we go into back, we have a fight, and the battle's over, and then we relax, and we go back to our jobs and relaxing and getting on with our lives again. They don't think like that. To them, every battle is just part of the greater war. They're never going to sleep. They're never going to put on their guns. They're never going to um, just give up. They're going to come back all the time. They're going to come back all the time. They'll always try and get rid of your Second Amendment rights. South Africa, they're not happy with the one revolution, they're going to be a revolution. And if they're not happy with that one, they'll probably go for a third one again. They also don't work as we do with small amounts of time, as in, well, just this year we're doing this, and maybe next year, we can't think further than two years. <coughs> These guys prepare 40 years in advance. They'll fight for an issue for 40 years. They'll hand over the issue to their grandchildren to keep fighting if they've set the agenda for it. And what do we do? Cool, we don't want to carry on. We don't have the energy for that. We want to just be left alone. We want to get on with our lives. We want to have a happy family and enjoy a good bit of sport and a nice beer on a Saturday afternoon. We don't want to have to fight all the time. But that's their thinking. And if we're not able to take them on all the time in these issues, well, they're going to get the upper hand. They love centralization of power, too, because they can have all these uh, loads of uh, different commissions and organizations and committees and things that basically it hides all the stealing and the theft that goes on. So they love centralization of power. Um, and if there's any issues between the conservatives and these radical terrorist-type groups, I guess you always have to give up. We must always give up and compromise. The conservative people, those who are wanting free freedom, those who are wanting... Uh, federal system, who don't, who want decentralization of power, who don't want the central government to have all the power. Uh, those are the people that always need to give up. 
The other thing is, they network really well. They will network with anybody to, to get their agenda across. In South Africa, what do we conservatives do? We fight with each other all the time. Oh, somebody said this and now my heart is bleeding and I'm crying and I'm all upset with them and I'm offended. These guys don't care about that. They have a set agenda and they go for it. Uh, they've got long range goals. Everything they do, they're always looking to educate and recruit. All the time, in whatever they do. If they're going to play sport, if they're going to a meeting, if they're handing out a newspaper, they are educating and they're recruiting all the time. <coughs> we don't think like that. I don't know about you, but we, we struggle with this. You know, we do a little letter to the editor and then for six weeks don't do anything again and um, really uh, haphazard. But they, they've got their long-range goals and they go for it. Confrontation. They thrive on it. What, what do they do with the confrontation? <coughs> Get you to back off. That's what they're doing. You find it in the liberal media or liberal thinking politicians. You get it amongst the terrorists. Confrontation is just a game. It's to put the opponent on the defense. So let Lapa, the commander of the attackers at the church, uh, was at an airport with me. We were having an interview, and a reporter said to him, why did you attack the people in the St. James Church? What did you do it for? Apartheid was gone long ago. Everybody was sitting around the negotiation table. They were busy developing a new constitution for the country. Then you went and bombed the church. What for? And him being a military man, he's not, he's not a politician, he just said, this was a terrorist attack in the true sense of what terrorism is all about. It is to instill fear in the whites in South Africa. The whites were running the government at the time. Basically, we wanted to scare the living daylights out of them so they'd just give up and hand over everything to us. That was the bottom line. And the Klaap and I are friends. We have breakfast together. I said, we disagree on everything, but the, you can have respect for your enemy and you can uh, speak to them and find out how they think. Perceptions become reality. The small little group of terrorists, four people that shot up our church, you cannot believe the impact that that attack had on 45 million people in South Africa. So a tiny little group, very small, almost insignificant politically. And they do one thing that gets worldwide attention and they get they put the fear of hell into everybody in your country to the extent that people say we give up, tell our politicians to stop arguing, they mustn't you know, uh, argue about these things, hand over the place, we want to live in peace, give them whatever they want, and we want to get on with our lives. So that, that's the way things work. So the perception of this thing is that they are so massive, they're so great, they control everything. No, they don't. They're a small, tiny, little, insignificant group. They do one act, and they frighten the living daylights out of everybody. Knowledge is power, people say. The terrorists don't believe that. They'll say knowledge is power, but only if it can be put into action. And so BCDL can have all the greatest ideas of uh, how gun legislation should be, but if you don't get people to go to the voting booths, or you don't get people to write letters to the editor, or you don't, you don't recruit friends at work, or you, all these sorts of things, then nothing's going to happen. So that's the way they think. They're recruiting all the time to get people to get their feet out on the street and to make a difference. Well. The other thing is, I've never met a stupid terrorist. They're not dumb. The communists go for the top, most wise, clever, top students at the schools. They're looking for those who are idealists, those who want to go out and change the world. I said, we'll help you do it. We'll show you how to do it. The Communist Party has all the ideas, we have the equipment, we've got the training, and we'll make a leader out of you. So that's the way they think. I've told you about the use of words. The other thing too is they have a great vision. They have an amazing vision for the future, a communist utopia. And that's what they're working and living towards. What are we working, what is our vision? To keep what we've got. You see they're thinking, it's like the sports team who doesn't have the cup. Well they're far more aggressive, they're far more on the ball, they're far more um, hardcore because they want to win the cup. Because the team who owns the cup already who has got the cup, but they're just defensive. So that's the way they work. They want to take everything from you. And they don't want to put anything on the table. So we want your gun rights. Uh, we want to educate your children. We want to do this. Uh, we want to do that. And, and you must just give everything to us. But they're not putting out anything at all. And so we are just defensive. But we need to say no. We want total freedom for guns. It's got nothing to do with you. 
uh, leave our children alone, they don't belong to the state, get, of our, get out of our faces, stay out of our education system, all you're doing is ruining everything anyway. Uh, that's the way we actually need to deal with them. So that's uh, some of the ideas um, of the things that we're dealing with in South Africa. And at the end of the day, we believe that uh, a gun in the hand is, is better than a cop on the phone uh, under the circumstances that we live in. So if there are any questions or comments, um, yeah, just yeah, boy, awesome. um, well, You were uh, not charged then with the, with the church. Uh, they didn't come after you because you had the audacity to shoot a terrorist. Okay, very good question. Uh, didn't they come after me because I had the audacity to shoot a terrorist? Well, some really interesting things did happen. I spoke to the police. I, did, I met with the police generals and top police uh, people, obviously, because I had shot back at the attackers. Uh, one of my rounds was actually stuck in the wall above the heads of the terrorists. So, pity that shot didn't hit. Um, that was the then, warning shot. <laughs> what was that? That was the warning shot. That was the warning shot. <laughs> yes, thank you. I should remember that next time. Um, yeah, so there's one shot in the wall, and then um, I had a policeman say to me afterwards, he said, if you hit one person inside this church, we'll have you up for culpable homicide. Not, thank you for protecting the people. Thank you for scaring them off. No, we'll have you up for culpable homicide if we find out you hit somebody in this church. Oh. Forget the people that are blown up in pieces. Yes, yes. Well, they off scot free today. Um, they uh, had what we had called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. And basically, if you could show that the crime you were involved with um, had uh, political uh, implications, you could be let off. So uh, none of them are in jail now. In fact, two of them, I think, are in our military forces right now, uh, of the attackers that attacked our church. One died in a car accident. Yes, sir. Um, why did you have your gun, and did anybody else in the church have a gun for self-defense? Great. Good question. Why did I have a gun with me, and did anybody else have? Uh, I know of two other people that had guns with them. They weren't in a position to shoot uh, or to return fire. That um, Well, they definitely didn't. Um, and I had mine because I had already been attacked in my vehicle one day. Um, I'd been thrown with rocks and bricks. There were tires burning in the road. There was chaos in a, a town I was driving through. And uh, my brand new car was smashed um, with these rocks and bricks. And I did a quick U-turn, drove off to the police, told them that there were there was chaos in that area. They went out to help them, and I immediately applied for a firearm at that stage. And I thought the next time somebody threatens my life, I'm going to protect my, my life. So I carried a gun 24-7 after that, um, all the time. And that's the way we live in South Africa now. We can't sleep like you sleep in your house here. Uh, it took us a couple of months when I arrived here for us to be able to sleep through the night. Because any noise, we wake up for you get your gun and you go see what's going on. See if the children are right, check around the house. We have big burglar bars over all our windows, bolted into our brickwork. We have security gates on every single door. And about three weeks before I came to America in June last year, uh, somebody broke into my neighbor's house, broke his security gate and his door, got inside and stabbed him in the shoulder. And then the stabber was caught in my garden by the police with all my kids standing at the window watching the arrest taking place. So my kids are traumatized. They're worried. They're concerned. We, um, you know, it was every, the, the houses are wooden. We don't live in wooden houses. So, you know, they creak at night. And my wife would wake up and say, somebody's trying to get in by the front door here in America. I was like, no, man, there's nobody at the front door. And I'm checking to see what's going on and, you know, all this sort of thing. But that's the way we live. That's mm -hmm. the way the circumstances are. You sleep with one eye open <laughs> and your ears don't rest. Do you so, have dogs? Do I have dogs? To, to alert you? Um, do I have dogs to alert me? Uh, we have uh, a small dog in the house, which is one of the top three things in South Africa to alert uh, or to put off burglars and murderers. They say uh, one of the top, I don't know what the other two are, I can't remember. I was just intrigued by when I read the report, was a man doing his doctorate in South Africa on criminology. And he went and interviewed thousands of um, criminals in, in prison. And they said that uh, a small dog inside the house that makes a heck of a noise is one of the worst things for them. They, they, they are the, the alarm system. Um, so we've got a, a little dog. Big dogs they don't care about. They just shoot them outside and, you know, with a pistol with a silencer on or they feed them meat with poison. So they're not worried about big dogs. But little dogs inside the house uh, causes havoc for them. So... So are you uh, just visiting America? Are you going 
Okay, am I just visiting America or am I going to immigrate? Yes, um, we're just visiting. I'm marketing my book, um, going around, um, letting people know about that, also raising funds for our, our mission work over there. As I say, we're well, working in South Africa, Zambia, uh, up into the Congo, which is, uh, Congo is really a, a mess, a very, very difficult area to work in. The people there are traumatized by war and uh, the raping and the, the chaos is just uh, out of this world. Um, my newsletters over there, free newsletters, just help yourself over there. One of them is about a young, a young soldier um, who was a boy soldier, a kid, child soldier. He went to war at the age of 13. And he said, the government changed our ages on our birth certificates so that the United Nations couldn't accuse us of having child soldiers. Anyway, he was working for the government army, and they were called out to Kisangani, which is where a lot of the rebels were busy fighting, and the the own forces phoned in and said, please, we need backup. Um, we're low on the ground. There's trouble here. The rebels are taking over. Please send forces out. So they took the guys in the airplane. Jean was one of them. Off they went to Kisangani. As they landed there, the rebels were waiting for them on the runway. Rebels said to them, you will join our forces. So it was all a setup. Um, it wasn't their own people calling them. You will join our forces, and you're going to join the rebel movement. And the lieutenant, the officer in charge, said, under no circumstances whatsoever, took him out of the airplane, put him on the tarmac, and put a bullet in the back of his head. Everybody else joined the rebels. <laughs> and so this, this young boy of uh, 13 that I met, is quite an incredible young chap, he's, he's become a Christian now, uh, he's um, uh, bringing up a family, and he's um, really, he's struggling out there. I mean, people like that don't have jobs, and, and that sort of thing. So I was speaking to him and saying to him, well, Jean, what would you have done? Because they, they used to go and um, attack villages. And they would find somebody that was riding along with all these bananas on the back of his bicycle. They'll beat him senseless, get all the information out of him about the local village and um, how it's situated, who lives where. And then they'd go and attack those villages. And they, he, this young boy said to me, as the men were running away, we'd shoot them in the back. We'd kill them. Then we'd rape all the women. And the young boys we take to war with us. Child soldiers are always the best for them. They don't need payment. They just fight, do what they're told, and they get their food, and that's it. And he said to me, we got food, and I know there was drugs in our food. Um, that's the, the way they live. So I said to him, but Jean, those villages you attacked, none of them could defend themselves. What, what would have happened with your rebel soldiers if those villages, all the men were armed? with guns. And he looked at me and he said, that would have made our lives very difficult. <laughs> they could do whatever they want in those areas, the rebel soldiers. Yeah, I was thinking about the fact that here are these guys, you know, they come with the evil AK-47s and uh, the power of a rifle. And you, with a little snub-nosed Rossi, got them running and got them to jump in a car. Um, it says a lot about the power of self-defense and how cowardly um, a lot of these are. I think holds true with criminals. I think the same thing happens. Because they've got a big rifle, you get somebody um, to shoot back at them, and all of a sudden everything changes. Yes, it, that's it right. It clarifies why gun control is such yeah. an atrocity for everybody. Yeah. Philip was just saying, for those at the back, that it's amazing what difference just one little small little Rossi point three eight special can do, um, even if you've got AK-47s or R4 rifles, automatic assault rifles shooting at you. And that's true. I mean, I look at this and say, gee, this is the grace of God. I'm still alive and well. But uh, I have a very simple um, ideology, philosophy of self-defense. And the basic idea is the bad guys use surprise to be able to get you off guard. You're going to find an opportunity to surprise them back. That's my basic philosophy. Um, the other thing too, to, to get training, uh, if you're going to carry a firearm, get training. And I don't, my personal opinion again, I'm sure the trainers here who are going to want to hang me for saying this, the attitude and the psychological idea behind it is far more effective than whether you can shoot straight or not. Um, to have that attitude of, I will not die with a bullet in the back of my head, I will die fighting, um, goes a long way. Um, you can be the best shot in the world, but if you don't have that attitude to, to say, thus far, no further, you know, um, the shot's not going to help you. The, the sheer confidence that you might project with the proper training 
Yes, itself, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Itself, so the confidence that comes from the uh, I'm saying, uh, goes a long way. Don't ever underestimate it. And if you just think you're great at shooting at a target on a uh, shooting range, and that's all you do, and you don't get some of that psychological training, um, I don't want to say it's, I mean, it's good. You, your gun must become an extension of your hand, but or your arm. But um, that psychological training and being ready uh, and, you know, have the idea, especially with women, you know, I will not stand or just lie down and keep quiet if I'm going to be raped. I'm going to put up a fight. You know, that kind of attitude uh, make, goes a long way. That confidence of, you know, I'm not going to put up with your nonsense. Yeah. Great, well, that's uh, my time's up. I did watch the time and um, put it past eight, put it nine. Um, thank you so much to uh, Philip and the VCDL um, committee. Really appreciate you having me out here this evening. Again, my books and DVDs will be available at the restaurant. Please help yourself to my um, uh, whatever newsletters over there. They're free. Help yourself. Also, my cards are there. Uh, I'm in the area for three months, so if you want to have me around for coffee, I'd like, love to come over with some coffee. And um, also, if you'd like to join my mailing list, now I am a Christian missionary, so it's Christian information that's going to come about mission work in Africa and all the chaotic things we do amongst rebel soldiers and all that sort of thing. If you're interested, you're welcome to, and I've got permission from Philip to add this round. If you want to put down your email address or join our mailing list, please do that. Good, thank you very much, Philip.